Season 1, Episode 14. Welcome to Forever Break Podcast. Now, two people who will always overstay their welcome and visa. Here are your hosts, Leanne and Corey. All right. Well, thank you so much, voiceover guy. We are excited to be here with you all for this episode on money and mindfulness. On this pod, we're going to be talking about how we can all have a healthier relationship with money and what even is money? Why do we value it so much more than other important things like, uh um, happiness? Uh Does money buy happiness? Does happiness give you money? I don't know. But then we're going to look at good debt versus bad debt and how to be more mindful of spending and pro-budget tips. Money within our culture and then interview with the lovely Kel Gallivan, a.k.a. Mrs. Smart Money, who uh, has really changed her family's life over the last year. Really cool interview. You guys are going to be interested to check that out. And if you guys want to take an even deeper dive as usual, why don't you visit the Forever Break website, foreverbreak.com, to just get all of the information on everything we cover and more. Quick quote. It's good to have money and the things that money can buy. But it's good, too, to check up once in a while and make sure that you haven't lost the things that money can't buy. By George Lorimer. I like that. Deep. That makes me ponder. Yeah, it also goes very well with um, what our interviewee had to say. Take a second, rewind it, listen to that again. That's a good one. Focus on. So we all know from the late 90s that Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Diddy, whatever name he's going by these days, said it's all about the Benjamins, baby. But is it? Well, they say money makes the world go round, and in one sense it does. But do you ever stop and think, why does money often take first place in our thoughts? If we command our wealth, we shall be rich and free. If our wealth commands us, we are poor indeed. Edmund Burke, wise words. Um, So we're focused in this episode on being deliberate and conscious about what we do with our money and why. We value clothes, food, holidays, gadgets, I know I'm guilty there, entertainment, but do we really need all of that to be happy? Does money mean power or does power bring more money? Power resides where men believe it resides, according to our favorite bold eunuch from Game of Thrones. Varys, for those of you who do not know. And our society is built around the idea that those who have more money have a better life. But to make money, you have to sacrifice time. Should we be focusing on that or on saving smarter instead of working harder? Why do you work? So I can live. Yeah. (laughs) Like, think about it. Why do you work? Like, are you working as a means to an end? Are you working to buy yourself all the things that you would want? Do you really enjoy the work that you do? Like, ask yourself that question and figure out why is it that you're going in and doing, putting all of this time into this process and what is the result that you're hoping to get from it? I think that that's a good question to have. Are you living to work or do you work to live? Really great question. Mm-hmm. Spending patterns and habits can reflect internal issues that require further attention. Perhaps it's an overcompensation for an unresolved struggle. For example, if you don't feel valuable in yourself, you might turn to a spending spree at the mall to make you feel better. Guilty. However, the benefits will only be brief and the rush will fade rather fast, leaving you feeling emptier than before. Have a listen to episode one where Chris Armstrong talks about the importance of self-love. Digging deeper. So there is a difference between good debt and bad debt. Not all debt is bad. Sometimes you must get into some form of debt to push yourself ahead in your life goals. But understanding how to manage that debt is very important. So the good debt doesn't become overwhelming. Examples of good debts are things like mortgage, student loans, etc., etc. Yeah. Are student loans overdone? An example of this, Leanne has a student loan and has been traveling since she graduated. Luckily for her, in the UK and Australia, you do not have to pay back until you're earning over a certain amount. But was it worth it? Are you using that degree? I mean, it's been nearly six years, and although the video editing has come in very handy in the last year, mm-hmm. other than that, I haven't you? I haven't you? Sh- yeah. Um, So bad debt is debt for leisure, pleasure, or entertainment. The asset does not go up in value, such as a car, Um, getting a credit card to buy clothes, gadgets, experiences that you can't afford. So why is this so common? I got to tell you, I got, I don't, I don't know why, but I've just always been someone who's pretty good with money. But when I was first out of high school and going to, in my first semester of college, I remember this girl who took out 
an extra $5,000 in student loans just to go on a one-week spring break vacation. That's so ridiculous. $5,000 for one week is so excessive. Yeah. (laughs) And I mean, she just like, it was, it just like, even at 18 years old, it just caught my brain of just like, you're going to be done with school in four years. You're going to have this one-week memory that is going to like fade so fast and what about spring break next year? Is she going to do that again the next year and the next year? Yeah. Well, then you start thinking about things like interest on top of that yeah. 5000 over the next four years and just mind boggling. So obviously we discourage that kind of spending. So that's the idea of bad debt. Good debt. I mean, it's hard to have heavy cash supplies on hand to be able to just buy a home um, outright. Yeah. So I, people have to take on a mortgage, but a mortgage tends to be good debt because over time, the um, value of a real estate property is going to appreciate, not a guarantee. Obviously, there's things at play, but over time, that has proven to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um, So a mortgage is a good debt to have because when you sell it, you pay it off, and hopefully you've got some equity in there that you can help to go and buy something even better. There you go, some budgeting advice and some real estate advice from a former real estate agent. Mm -hmm. However, um, one thing I do have to say is that it is just being mindful and not living outside of your means. That's literally like what the takeout is that I get here. Let's unpack that. Alrighty, so we're just going to do a quick listicle of budgeting tips. Easier said than done, but let's give it a go. To travel, take advantage of temporary work visas and travel. Work as you travel. Saves you a bunch, pays for a bunch. Yeah. Um, seasonal or contractual work instead of just getting that steady Monday to Friday nine to five maybe you want to try and like have more control over the time in your life so what you're going to do is pick up jobs that are three or four months long longer shorter doesn't really matter but you've got this segment of time where you're going to be working hard probably working long hours but then you get to take a break reset go on a little vacay and then come back and try it again oh Try and start a new podcast so you don't have to go back to that job. That'll happen. Hey. And um, so holidaying on a budget, obviously holidaying is such a luxury, but being open to destination and dates is a really big one. So something that I do, I head over to Skyscanner and I put the destination as anywhere. And if you're just flexible with your dates and say show the whole month or whatever, then you can find out great deals for the time that you want to go out on holiday. When and where. When and where, yeah. Yeah. Um, Look into off-season travel. Um, A lot of times off-season can be more enjoyable than peak season unless you're just looking for those crazy crowded beaches. Um, And the accommodation can be cheaper and there's just any of the excursions that you might do might be cheaper. Just something to really think about. And cooking. Just because you're on vacation doesn't mean you have to go out to eat every night. So why not grab a place that has a kitchen and instead of just eating, you can try and cook one of those fabulous new dishes that you've tried in a restaurant. Yeah. Let's switch gears over to leisure buying. Um, Go to sale racks exclusively or buy on the marketplace in charity shops. Eating at home, you can try a plant-based diet so you aren't spending a fortune on meat. Um, That's what I used to do in Australia. I went veggie pretty much just because I couldn't afford to. Yeah, no, it it, it really can. It can add up over time. And And with drinking, pregame. I think that's a really good one. Yeah, because I know we've all at college, we all used to do it and then like go out and not spend that much money. But honestly, what's stopping you now? Cocktails are expensive. Mm -hmm. Drinks are expensive. But if you can just buy a box of wine, drink that at home and then go out with a buzz, drink some water, have a couple of beers, you're all good. Yeah, save that bar tab. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Leanne, you can talk on this one better than I can. Cosmetics. Uh, Yeah, girls, you all look fabulous, no doubt about it. But do you need to buy every top of the line makeup so often and wear it every single day? I'm sure everyone's experiencing in quarantine. Y'all are so much more beautiful without all of that makeup on. Mm -hmm. And I'm guilty of this. I see a new gadget. I see a drone. I see a new computer, something like that, the new microphone for podcasting. <laughs> if I don't have He's the money, right now. I will put that on the old credit card. But that's not the best way to do it. Do you really need it now? Ask yourself these questions when you're talking about budgeting. Like, do the I iPhone. need this now? And I think another trap that I see people falling into is, ooh, that's normally um, $1,000, but right now I can get it for $600. I've got to buy it. Mm -hmm. And do you have the $600? What is that $400 savings going to do? What if you just waited another two months, saved the money? 
Um, are you one, are you still going to want it? And two, is it really going to make that big of a difference to save that $400? So try to watch out for these kinds of mental traps that we can all fall into. Yeah, I think the message here is basically, guys, just to prioritize your goals. If you want to splash out on all of that stuff, fine, and you can afford it, do it. If it makes you happy, do it. But before you do, try and stop, assess, and look to the future. There's nothing wrong if you can afford it, but think about if you prefer to save some money, go and visit one of our amazing destinations we're going to talk about in a later season, or buy X amount of leisure things. Yeah, I think that's really good. And we're going to segue here into our interview. And one of the key things that she talks about is core values. And I think that that's a really good point. So hang around and listen to this interview. Inspiring interview. Today we will be joined by Mrs. Smart Money herself, Kel Gallivan. Kel, who heralds from Lucky Ireland, is the author of the No Spend Yearbook, which will be released later this year, and is a budgeting coach. Um, she helps others learn how to get more bang for their buck. Quite literally, she has saved her family over 27,000 euros in 2019 from going from a two income family to a one income family. Pretty incredible stuff. So let's listen a little bit to Kel. Alrighty. So today we are joined with Kel Gallivan. How are you doing today, Kel? I'm good. I'm good, Leanne. How are you? Good. Well, I'm fantastic. We have a nice sunny day here, so can't complain. Um, but let's start off now with letting all of the audience know just who you are and can you just tell us a little bit about your background and how and why you got started as a budgeting coach? <laughs> the million dollar question, eh? Um, but mm-hmm. yeah. I, my story, it's, it's not the most uh, expected of stories. I, I wouldn't have had a financial background naturally. Um, I was actually a scientist okay. when I started off and I worked in the farm industry for oh God, well over 16 years and I loved it and it was absolutely great job. But um, I had two kids and I just found that with with work and with mm-hmm. commuting and everything, I just felt like their childhood was passing me by and I wasn't around to see it. And mm-hmm. I, I knew I had to do something or I'd, I would regret it. So I, I sat down with my husband and we said, OK, um, I decided I wanted to take a bit more time at home with the kids okay. and the job I had wouldn't have allowed for that. It was just the nature of the job that I had. So we sat down and we worked out the math. Look, what if we took a year out, if I took a year out uh, with the kids um, mm-hmm. and just take it from there and I could go back after a year, at least I'd have that year. So uh, he said, yeah, look, we give it a go. So, but that meant that our income would have been cut in half. Um, and I said, right, okay, well, if I'm going to be home with the kids, and I'm cutting our income in half, I was going to make the money that I did have that was coming into the house work as hard as it possibly could. And that's what started off the no spend year. And the no spend year ran for 2019. And I I had a blog kind of going in the background more to keep me accountable than anything else. But it just it just took off. And yeah, it, it, it just grew arms and legs. And I was on Instagram as well. And that took off as well. And people just seemed to like what I was doing. So from that, I would get um, kind of people asking questions, what would they do around budgeting and saving money and all Mm -hmm. that. And that just evolved then into what I'm doing now is uh, coaching people on how to manage their budgets. And I can do it all from home. So I get to work from home with my kids and have an income, which is the absolute dream for Which me. I, I want to do that. How yeah. do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious too if that was, I mean, it doesn't sound like that was your set up plan. Like it, you just kind of stumbled into it to just be like, well, I'm going to try and do this. And then just over time, people kind of gravitated towards it and it just kind of became what it is today, which I think is really cool. Absolutely. Like it, it surprised me. I didn't think anybody would be interested in what I was doing on a day-to-day basis with my, mm-hmm. my few euro here and there. But mm-hmm. it just, it seemed to work. And, but even, even with the numbers at the end of the no spend year, I was surprised by the difference that when you really did start getting mindful with money, the difference you could make with the money you had. So even though earning money was very important and getting money in, yeah. but what you did with that money when it got in was just as important and quite often more important. And and that, mm-hmm. I think, is what got people's attention. Yeah. And one of the things that, you know, really caught our eye was seeing on your website that you decreased your annual household <laughs> outgoing spending by 27 thousand euros 27 almost you know 27 and a half thousand euros and i think everyone is probably as impressed as we are and wondering how so i'm kind of wondering 
Um, was it lots of little things? Was it a combination of really big expenses and little things or just kind of what direction did this end up going? Yeah, I, I did not think it would be anything like that. I, I, I knew I would save a bit because obviously there were some bigger yeah. things in it. Like I, we didn't have childcare anymore. Um, we would have been a two car um, household. Mm. We moved to one electric vehicle that saved a lot. So they were kind of two big things. But one of the massive ones that really kind okay. of shocked me was our food budget. And that was something that everybody has control over. But we, I worked really hard. I gave us, I cut our food budget in half. And uh, actually for the no spend year as well, just to digress every so slightly. So with the no spend year, we cut back on all our discretionary yeah. spending. So we decided we weren't going to eat out for the year. I decided I wasn't going to dye my hair or buy makeup or buy clothes or anything like that for a whole year. Uh, and part of that was... Sacrifice. <laughs> It, but the thing is, it it might seem like sacrifice, but for me, it was could I stay at home, and that was worth more to me than that was having really, you know yeah. the trip to the salon or you know having that extra takeaway. So yeah. it was it didn't mm-hmm. it, it once I was doing it for reasons that were important to me, it didn't seem like such a sacrifice, and I think that was a big thing for me to get yeah. my head around as well. But once I did, and day to day, I used to kind of can nearly give myself a high five, but I'm at home with my kids. This is what I wanted more than anything else. And we're not throwing away our financial future yeah. either, getting that nice balance. But the food budget, one of the biggest things that I realized with that was how much food I was throwing away. And that was money straight in the bin. And I, I didn't think that I was mm-hmm. throwing much food away because I thought I was relatively careful. But when I actually started looking at what I had and looking at what I had in the presses before I went shopping and looking at what was in the fridge, and making meals based on what I already had in the house. Then it was just a matter of getting the extra few bits that I needed. And even yeah. as the week went on, if I saw something that was kind of close to, you know, uh, it needed to be used up or whatever, that's what I would focus on using in the next meal. And as it turns out, not only did okay. we cut our food budget in half, so we brought it down from about 10,000 euro to under 5,000 euro, we never ate so well. We never ate so much organic food. We oh, never wow. ate. You know, I, we weren't now I don't know if this coincidence or what but I have two young kids and they usually have sniffles and colds and goodness knows what else throughout the year but for the whole mm-hmm. year and even so far into this year not one of us has been ill thank goodness and I don't know yeah. if God, that's, so weird. that's part of it or what but I would have always had to go to the doctor at some stage with the kids during the year for something but no they yeah. uh, well things will stay as they are because I continued on even even after the no spend year ended the the hundred euro a week food budget um because I just found that we ate so well we wasted much less and we were still saving money and that five thousand difference yeah. from the ten thousand from the year before like that's post tax money so you think how much you actually have to earn just to get that extra food in the house that yeah and yeah (laughs) that's crazy isn't it that's so interesting that you brought up food because um I was thinking about this when we were thinking about what questions to ask and I was like wow I bet if I looked at my expenses I'm probably going to be quite shocked about how much money I actually spend on both food and entertainment you know like going out for a drink or going out and watching a movie or going out for dinner and um even though I know I enjoy activities like hiking and things in nature that don't actually cost that much money for some reason you know we're just so used to spending money on that stuff and my question to you is do you did you have any shocking eye openers in your lifestyle expenditure when you used to kind of started going through it was there anything that you kind of was like oh wow can't believe we spend that much money on that you, you know what you actually hit the nail on the head when you were just saying about what you really like doing versus what you actually did do. yeah <laughs> <laughs> We fall into habits and we fall into routine. And, you know, particularly if, like, if you're working during the week, yeah. Monday to Friday, if you have a nine to five job, you'll have a routine and you might be getting the coffee, you know, in the morning and then maybe mm-hmm. a donut or something like that. And then, you know, Friday, you'll get a takeaway and a Saturday, you'll, you'll go out. But you might get just as much fun yeah. out of going on a hike or just, you know, meeting your friends somewhere, you know. And, yeah. and <laughs> your, but it, it that breaks your routine because your routine yeah. is... Monday to Friday, grab the coffee, get the takeaway. That's your routine. But your question with the eye openers, one of the biggest ones for me was was with the kids. And it was, I started doing a thing with the kids called no spend days. Now, a no spend day is 
is any day where you don't spend any money at all outside essential bills and your grocery. And I had to, obviously it was mm. a year, I had to do that a lot with the kids, but it was really hard at first because I, I was used to bringing the kids maybe to a, a play barn or, you know, out to a, a zoo or, you know, mm. something that would cost money and maybe ice cream afterwards. Yeah. It's just simple, not even expensive things, but just simple things. But when you have several kids and you might bring a friend, you know, yeah. one of their friends or something, it adds up to be quite yeah. a bit of money, particularly if you're doing it several times a month. Mm-hmm. So I really had to start thinking mm. outside the box because this was an entire year of their lives as, as well as my life. But it, mm. their, their childhood passes so fast. So I had to um, think, okay, well, what would be interesting for them that wouldn't cost us money? And I have to admit, that's where community came in big time and the local library and there was all like small little festivals and events that would have been going on at the time that you could just rock up to and have a great day and maybe bring a picnic with you as opposed to buying food there necessarily. And um, the kids got really big into camping and a lot more hiking, going to the beach. Nice. Uh, but there would be plenty of just different things that we could do. And also I kind of had to incorporate things that were more outside towns and villages because you're less tempted mm-hmm. to spend money then. So, you know, visiting old houses and yeah. Yeah. play parks and things like that. So it was more of a still doing loads of things, but in a different way. Mm-hmm. And that t- did take a bit more energy and it yeah. did take a bit more time, but it worked. And by the end of it, they didn't feel hard yeah. done by. They didn't feel like they were missing out because we could still meet their friends and we could still have play dates and we could still do all those things. It was just a different way of doing it. Yeah. And that was a big eye opener mm-hmm. to me. And that's it. The girls probably loved it. Uh, they probably yeah. loved being outside so much now, right? And they're like, oh, wow, we didn't do this before. And now they're like, probably love hiking and love camping and love all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And things like they love their bicycles and they would have always been around on their bicycles. And I personally am not a fan of cycling, but they had so much fun throughout the year bringing me places. And because I was trying to get them better with the rules of the road. And I, yeah, I'm just not a cyclist at all, but they found it hilarious because I could barely stay up on my bike. So that in itself was a whole. (laughs) But my cycling did get better. Yeah, free entertainment. (laughs) Oh, that's a good, absolutely. That's a yeah. <laughs> so it kind of seems like that was some of the the harder. That was one of the harder habits was just kind of the idea of planning all of these things and just being like, what's a creative way that we could go out and have a no spend day and still entertain ourselves? And I'm kind of just wondering, were there any other habits that like that that were the most difficult for your family to to alter throughout this process? Um. Well, actually, one of them was one of my own habits, um, and I would have been absolutely terrible for chilling out on a Friday night with a glass of wine and browsing the internet, looking at mm-hmm. clothes on sale or, you know, homewares on sale. Or just, <laughs> Guilty. Just You're speaking to the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I kind of just took it for granted because you're after working hard for a week and you, yeah. you, you're told you deserve to chill out and enjoy yourself. And, you know, like what's 20 euro yeah. or 20 dollars? You know, you just flitter it away here and there. But I had that that wasn't a yeah. possibility during the no spend year. So I had to stop that. And actually, that was one of the reasons why I gave up alcohol for the year as well, because then it took the temptation away. But what I had to do yeah. was, um, to stop me doing that. I had to put up what, well, I'm sure I'm not the first person to use this, but it's a thing called a velvet rope. Um, I heard it somewhere and I just think it's brilliant, but it just make my life easier rather than me scrolling through going, oh, I can't buy it. What I did was I said, well, what if I don't see these websites in the first place? So I, I didn't realize how oh, many okay. subscriptions I had to newsletters for different stores and shops and online things. Mm-hmm. So I started unsubscribing yeah. from all the different newsletters. Yeah, it was such a simple thing to do. But the thing is, for some of them, some of my more favored ones, I had this real FOMO, this real fear of missing out. Of what if I missed a really good mm-hmm. sale or what if I missed whatever it was? And I had this, <laughs> I, I know, isn't it terrible? It's really bad. Um, <laughs> this kind of anxiety of, well, yeah, what if I miss that great dress? And, and I know it sounds so superficial, but it was... I just think it's a very human thing. We get that, that whole fear of missing out. But I made myself unsubscribe to everything with the rationale that if I really, really missed it, at the end of the year, I'd resubscribe. And as it turns out, most stores, they're fine with you resubscribing. They don't mind. They're, they're happy to have you back at yeah. any stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yes, yeah, so that that worked out well because then I wasn't seeing you know the flash sales and all that kind of stuff. So if I wasn't seeing them, I wasn't missing them as much. That was mm-hmm. a, a a big thing for me, uh, putting those kind of things in place and also limiting um, my time browsing. If I caught myself browsing, I try and make myself just put the iPad away or whatever it was and just go do something else, read a book, whatever. So yeah. that was a, mm-hmm. a, a tough habit for for me to break through the year. And I didn't even realize it was a habit. And that's the thing. Yeah. I yeah. hadn't even thought for a second because that, that's what everybody does. You know, y'all just chill yeah. out and have a browse. You know. No, it's really true. And I mean, I think that's where mindfulness comes into play, right? Because you just have like you just started you wouldn't notice those things otherwise because, you know, habits just become ingrained in us and then it just be, it kind of floats back into the subconscious and unless we become mindful of it of like well why am i sitting here browsing bathing suits if i'm not gonna buy one and it's winter like what is going on yeah it's a good time to buy a bathing suit because of the prices but what am i doing Corey's looking at me specifically because that's my weakness <laughs> Like there are so many beautiful clothes and all, and it's not just clothes, it's anything, it's gadgets, food, it's all these things hitting the market yeah. and you see them and you go, oh, that's so lovely. And you have this aspirational lifestyle in your head, but yeah. you have four or five bathing suits already at home that have hardly been worn. And, and that's, yeah. you don't need <laughs> the new one. <laughs> but th- that was one of the things that I had to big time change at my mindset as well as I didn't think I had that many clothes because I even though I know I've spent the last few minutes talking about clothes, but uh, I, I didn't think I did. So when I put the spending ban on on clothes mm. along with everything else, um, I thought I'm I'm not going to even get through the year. My, they'll all fall apart. I'll have, I'll just be wearing socks and you know my my pajamas by the end of the year. Yeah. But as it turns out, <laughs> I, I still had plenty of clothes. I bought hardly anything when the year ended, except oh no, I did. I bought something because I really missed them. Really nice socks. Oh, okay. that's, that's fair. Thing. That's fair. And it gets cold in Ireland. I so. think you earned it. <laughs> All right. So talking about budgeting and things like that, um, I, this is a two part question. So the first part is how much extra time would you say was incorporated every week in planning for your family budget? And the second part is what are three common things that people typically spend too much money on? And what would you suggest that they start tackling first? Okay, that is that's a big one. Um, I'll do the, the first part first. That's quite it is. <laughs> Take your time. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, with the no spend year, my rules are very strict. I had a hundred euro per week for food. I couldn't uh-huh. buy clothes, and I couldn't. Like, it was straightforward. Now it took a while to get used to them, but once the rules were in place and mm-hmm. there was no moving on them, everything else just flowed from it because I, I, I didn't have to think too much about the budget okay. because that was the budget. You. I just wasn't allowed to buy clothes for the year. If the mm-hmm. kids needed clothes, like if they genuinely ran out of socks, they could get some and I would get, get one packet of socks for them as opposed to four or five or whatever. Um, so I didn't actually spend extra yeah. a lot of extra time once the rules were in place. That was part one. Because it doesn't, once you follow the rules, okay. you don't have to think about it. So it doesn't take time. It's just done. The other yeah. part, yeah, um, and actually, I didn't expect that. I thought I would be all day just pouring over budgets and spreadsheets, but no, that was one of the least consuming um, things of my time during the year. Um, okay. With regards budget to tips, oh, goodness, where how long is a piece of string? Um, <laughs> I suppose for me, the food, right? You probably know this already, but the the, the fat expenses, food, accommodation, and transport—they are three yeah. big things that that costs massive amounts and it, you might when it comes to transport you might be lucky enough that you don't need a car um mm. you may live with your parents and you may not have rent but you cannot not eat right you mm. you have to eat it's 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 you have to eat to survive so that yeah. is something that can easily get out of control because we can justify huge budgets because you have to eat and go oh well i'm hungry so i'm gonna buy this so that's one thing just thinking about the food that you have and try not to waste food and using up what you have and and focusing on that that's a huge money saver straight away the second one um is and i know we've been talking about it a bit but it's true it's clothes it's Mm -hmm. thinking about well what do you need do you need seven pairs of blue jeans or will you know a couple do you just fine and then when one gets worn out you buy another pair you know do you Mm -hmm. need another white shirt and just think mm-hmm. about what you're buying. And when you're buying it, like, uh, I'm thinking a lot more about fast fashion. Mm-hmm. And you might buy a top on a great sale and it's only $20 or 20 euro or whatever it is. 
um, but you might buy a really good shirt for a hundred and you wear yeah. the really good shirt a hundred times and it costs you a dollar a go. You wear the, the fast fashion one on sale once, maybe twice. It's cost you multiples of that. So thinking about your clothes and, and what you're spending, kind of a quality over quantity type of thing, yeah. that's really important. And then the other quick thing is it's just your day-to-day spending. And I know coffee gets a bit of a, a beating about, but the small little things like the mm. lipstick, like the extra pair of socks you don't need, the yeah. the kitchen gadget, the the little tiny fritterings of things, the packet of crisps, the extra takeaway. Think yeah. about what, do you really want that or do you actually need to build an emergency fund? And yeah. just thinking carefully, is this the best value for your money? Okay. They yeah. would be my three top ones. Yeah. I think those are really solid. And to go back to the fast fashion thing, guys, if saving money isn't enough, the fast fashion is really bad for the environment. So why not try and reuse or get stuff that you're going to reuse? True. There you go. Do my environmental That's preach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, as this project has grown over you know, the last year and, and people kind of caught on and started following you as you were doing this with your family, and then started reaching out to you, just looking for advice and stuff. I'm kind of wondering if you started seeing some patterns in people and in relation to debt and why our culture is so obsessed with living beyond our means. Uh, this one, you could, I'd say there's 20 million books written on this and you can write 20 million more and still not cover it all. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's, it's very normal for people to carry debt. Mm-hmm. It's been absolutely normalized and it's, it's, it's encouraged uh, be it college debt and then you know you obviously get a loan for your car why it, it, it's you know it's um having the handbags having the shoes having the aspirational lifestyle and uh, there's a phrase acting as if and i know in its purest mm-hmm. form it's really good phrase but i think when people put it as a materialistic thing they mm-hmm. it gets twisted and instead yeah. of taking care of your basic needs first, like making sure your accommodation is covered, making sure you have your emergency fund, making sure all those important things are done first, they're skipping to step three or four and buying mm-hmm. the things they don't need and getting into debt on the back of it. And and I, mm-hmm. I just think it's, I would love if something would change in society to make debt less normal and make it make it cool to have an emergency fund and you know go to the <laughs> yeah, right. and, you know, instead of showing off your brand new handbag show off hey i've got you know a fully funded pension <laughs> you know i you know, i'm sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and i would love that to be the cool thing but unfortunately yeah. at the moment it's still a heavy slant towards the external materialistic thing and that's fine is... once you have the basis sorted first yeah like once you know you can afford it, then it's fine to indulge. It's your money. Do what you want, but just be smart about it. And um, so I have a question. How, how can a listener change their mindset and relationship with money to complement changing their actual spending habits? Yeah, this that's a good one. Um, and I think it, it's not actually going The answer <laughs> I'm going to give you is not about money. I think one of the biggest things, okay. one of the biggest things I think with people is that you you can't take everything away from them as in if somebody's used to a more high-flying lifestyle and then you just cut them back to nothing and say no you have to save that's not going to work and it's not going to work because Mm -hmm. well how many failed new year's resolutions does every the whole world have yeah you know we all say we're gonna have it was as easy as making that cold turkey decision we'd all be we don't have six packs and be ridiculously rich yeah Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) but it's it's not (laughs) <laughs> you have to think about it differently you have to replace what you're taking away with something that's better mm-hmm. and where I'm getting to with that and it's what made me step back from uh, from my from my work was my values my core values and if somebody can figure out what their core value is yeah. and to explain that a core value is something that is more important to you than anything else So my big example will always be my kids. Mm -hmm. My kids' childhood is short, as any kid's childhood is. I could always earn money, but I can never rewind time to go back to my kid's childhood. So even though I had what would be seen as a a decent enough job and I had a long career and and all that, and I will always be able to earn money, I can't rewind that time. And that's what made, I valued 
time in their childhood more than I did my paycheck in this time. Yeah. So when I had to cut back on all the other things, like cut down the food budget and go down to one car, it actually wasn't hard because I was getting that thing I valued the most. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, no, completely. that makes perfect sense. I was just thinking about what it was that like I value the most. And for me, it was always to see the world and travel. And, you know, I had money in the bank, but I would always stay in the cheapest accommodation and I would always eat super cheap because I knew there was always going to be another place I wanted to go to, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, but that, I can see that. Exactly. You, what, you were making decisions aligned with what you value. And that makes for a happier yeah. life and a happier person because you're doing the stuff that makes you happy. And because yeah. a, a big thing as well that I, I would personally value is my time and having mm-hmm. flexibility with my time and with my kids like that, just that, that yeah. I, I don't need much else to make me happy. So I can I'm happy to forego other things in my life. And that if you can figure out what it is that you value more than anything else, yeah. Then everything Good else falls. And if that something. if that kind of um if the sacrifice that you're making, if you can justify the means to that and actively be like, I'd really like to go to brunch with my friends, but that's also going to prevent me from doing this, which is my core value, and I've gotta keep that up on this pedestal because I yeah. know that that might affect my overall happiness um more long term. I think that that's the kind of way to starts changing that mindset of like what really are my values which leads us back into the whole idea behind being mindful about what you're spending your money on um one of the things that i think about is that it is hard to think about that because retail therapy is a real thing you're having a down day and going onto amazon and clicking one click buys are easy (laughs) but i'm wondering on the other end of that with technology did you use any apps or online tools and would you recommend any to help keep track of people's money (laughs) <laughs> oh, this is going to, I'm going to seem like a total and utter Luddite when I finish talking here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, a total and utter what? A Luddite. A Luddite. Yes, a person who's technology. <laughs> it's, um, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I a love Luddite. the internet and I love everything that it gives. However, when it comes to uh-huh. me and budgeting, I like to keep it really, really simple. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I am an old school, well, actually, it's nearly old school, but it used to be Excel, Uh and now I use Google Docs. Okay. Okay. And I have my budget done out on that, and that's what I have. And it's, I just think it's brilliant. I just put everything into it, my income, I pay myself first, my outgoings, and it's a zero-sum budget, and I see my whole year on one page, and it just makes life super easy for me. Um, And that's what I use. Now, I am sure there are so many more sharper tools out Mm -hmm. there, but personally, I I just use my my, my Google Docs and I just love hey, it. If that works Absolutely. for you, it works for you. Well, and I think <laughs> that's the point of this is to find something that works for you. I think for a lot of people, it might be here's I can sit down and I can do what you did and set my annual monthly weekly budget. And then maybe I need an app that is connected to my account and it starts setting an alert. So if my weekly budget in total is three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. As soon as I get to 250 and maybe it's Wednesday, I get an alert and there is um, all of a sudden like, ooh, I only got $50 for the next five days. And it's like that kind of thing that can like come into play. But I think that obviously, Kel, one thing that we can say about you is you're one, good at setting your budget and two, very, very good and I would say above and beyond most people and just being strict with yourself and sticking to it because yeah. I think that's probably the thing that is most difficult for people discipline. It, it, discipline does take a bit of work but it pays dividends particularly if you've figured out what it is that is most important to you and it and discipline gets a lot easier when you know what your values are and that to me is, is the absolute bottom line and then it's not deprivation then you're in building mode and building is where everybody wants to be because that's where you're going to get to where you want to go. And I know like our plan is fire and we're working towards that, even though my old income isn't coming in with everything else that we're doing, we're getting there. And it, it's, it's, it seems to be working so far. So long may that last. 
Yeah, that's, that's exciting. And finally, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your book, The No Spend Year, that's coming out later this year? Yes, that, that was a total surprise because, like I said, I was just a, a mum who started off a blog because she wanted to spend a bit more time. With me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, so uh, about halfway through the year, a publisher approached me. Long story short, I have a book coming out in the next few months, and it 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 literally it chronicles the whole year because it's. I, I suppose in one way I'm making it sound very easy, but there there was a whole learning curve at the beginning, trying to get used to it and then used to a new way of life. And um, so it chronicles all of that and dragging the kids along with me, even though it wasn't their choice. It didn't always go well. So there's all that in it, but there's a big arm of how to in it as well. So it should cover a lot of the kind of psychology behind it, along with kind of hints and tips on how somebody could apply it to their own lives. Great. Awesome. I think that's the most important thing, right, is people got to know that the person that they're taking some advice from, you know, wasn't all just peaches and cream the whole time. The line, yeah. You know, there was a there was a struggle and that, that they can hopefully be relatable in that sense. And I, I imagine that that's what this is, because just based on this conversation, we know that you come off as very relatable and it's yeah. not just like, oh, I've studied finance. I know all these things like, no, I was just someone who wanted to actively try and take control of my life. And I made some decisions and set some strict rules and followed yeah. them. And now look what I've done. It's pretty amazing. Kelsey. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never thought this would be a permanent pivot, but it's it's yeah, look, I'm a lucky person. That's a really great mindset. Well, thank you so much for your time today and just kind of teaching us some stuff and our listeners. And we really appreciate it. And we wish you and your family the best and to stay safe throughout all of this. Thank you so much for having me, Corinne It was a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. Interview Digestion. All right. Well, that was pretty amazing. I just think that it's so cool that she set her budget and was just so strict. Just stuck to it, yeah. I, I mean, that's just something that to me is just, I think it's beyond a lot of people because it's so easy to be like, oh, I can just... A couple dollars. And the hard part too is, and I think it ties into what she was saying about time because our excuse for just being like, you know what, I'm just going to order in tonight is I ran late at the office. Yeah. I've got a really early meeting tomorrow. I don't have time to like sit down and cook something. I don't have anything already prepped. So the easiest thing to do is just order some takeout. But that's not true. Um, don't have you don't have to you don't need time to cook a dinner really. No, and I mean I think a lot of stuff just comes into planning, but also just like being strict and being like, yeah. yes, I've had a long day. Yes, I have an early morning, but my main goal is to set aside X amount of dollars to buy my first house or do whatever. Yeah, so I need to I'm keep my eyes it. on that and just continue to do it this way. So really, really interesting stuff. I really love talking to her. Um, debt is obviously a cultural issue. Many of us learn our bad spending habits from parents or friends. But as Kel has pointed out, it's important that each of us take responsibility and be mindful of our spending. Yes, I know for sure. Next time I see that Instagram ad for that lovely pair of overalls that I want to buy, I am going to skip it. TBD. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> but um, guys, remember what we talked about with the nature thing as well. Uh, it really is just so amazing for you to be able to go outside and while you have time why not just go outside and enjoy free activities you know walk in nature it's literally good for your body your mind and your wallet it's the holy trinity under the magnifying glass so how does western culture differ in terms of attitudes towards money than developing countries in a developing country there's less time working more time with families and friends you kind of have to make do with what you have um obviously this isn't guaranteed for every country but it's more often that cash is used. Um, people don't seem to take out credit cards or lines of credit like what we have in mm -hmm. Western society. I almost feel like our society encourages us to get into debt. And with the rising prices of everything, it's easy to get into debt. In developing countries, there doesn't appear to be as much push to spend, spend, spend. Also, you have to bear in mind the lack of opportunity to make as much money. Things are cheaper, so you don't need as much. Um, but also, think of the times when we've been to Bali. How can the simple farmers we see in there have such big smiles on their faces? And these guys are genuinely really happy. They seem to have relatively modest, simple lives. We have comfortable cars, air-conditioned homes, and we're told we should be happier than those without. But we couldn't help but wonder if we've been lied to the entire time. Those with less have less to worry about and more time to focus on things that really matter like family and friendships. Rich people aren't necessarily happier and it's easy to fall into the trap as the more you have, the more you want, the more you're used to. 
if you think buying a TV, car or clothing will make you happy, it's actually a complete myth. That's I want you guys to fact check me on this, but I saw a stat. There's a bell curve of happiness and income and it's in U.S. dollars, but the curve peaks at one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. Anything before that, you're kind of worrying about, like, do I have enough to be able to really support me and my family? Do we overall have enough to be comfortable? After that, you aren't necessarily worrying about the comforts of it. You're worrying about losing it. And if I were to go from $110,000 a year down to $70,000 a year, would I be able to live and be where I'm at here? So I think that that was a really interesting stat to think about. And all of this being said, could you imagine if everyone in a Western society woke up, imagine guys, we all woke up tomorrow and we didn't have the plumbing that we have, that we have to pay for, but then instead we had an Eastern squat toilet with a bucket. Hey, we should all be saving money with bum guns rather than emptying out the TP aisle at the grocery store. It's very true. If we all had a bum gun, the toilet paper problem would not be a thing right now. Poop to shower process, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Take it further. So to visit Kel's website, you can go to MrsSmartMoney.com. Really nice name. And um, there you can find information about, she's got loads of blog articles. She's got tips. Um, If you want, if you're interested in just kind of getting an idea of when her book is going to come out later this year, we can, you'll have that. So that'll be in the show notes. So we know Kel didn't recommend any apps, but uh, one that we have is Good Budget. So Good Budget just basically helps you keep track of what debt you have when you pay off and just your general spending habits. Yeah, our producers have put together a free budget spreadsheet that you can download at the Forever Break website. Check the show notes for that. Um, This is just to give you help in starting your budgeting journey. Just fill in the boxes for income and expenses, and it will tell you how much you have left over or are short. And for any of the listeners who happen to be in the UK, if you do not know about Monzo Card already, uh, this is an awesome, it's an online bank where you open up your account or whatever, um, but it's like a travel card, but it basically just tells you what you're spending your money on. And you can organize, you know, I don't know, X amount of pounds to go into your bank account every month from your main bank account. And it's just an easy way to help you manage what you're spending. It's something I use abroad, um, just helps me keep a track of how much I'm spending every week when I'm traveling. Um, Yeah, that's a really good one. It doesn't charge you for overseas card transactions. It does not. Which is an important thing to note. It is, but not (laughs) not ATM. It does charge you for cash, but card. Um, Alternatively, TransferWise offers a free bank account in multiple currencies with free ATM withdrawals all over the world. Um, If you're in the U.S., I just switched my bank to this. If you're someone who travels abroad quite a bit, Charles Schwab is a great one. Any ATM fees or anything like that, they pay back to you at the end of the month. And next time you guys think about Benjamins, don't picture a $100 bill or Puff Daddy dancing around in a rap video. But reflect on his quote, a penny saved is a penny earned. It's really true. Just got to be disciplined and practice like anything else. Let's be mindful. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining us in our final episode of season one. I know I'm taking some of Kel's tips in mind. And if you haven't already, you should definitely check out her website, MrsSmartMoney.com, where you can read up on Kel's journey, her blog, and how you can get her help on reducing your spending today. Yeah, not only does she have ebooks on the site available to buy, she also has a free ebook on how to reduce the cost of your grocery shop, which I wish I had read at the beginning of this quarantine. <laughs> we just want to say a massive thank you to all of our guests for all of that invaluable information, the ideas we can take away from it, and also to our producers for all the hard work that they do to make our lives easier. Indeed. We really couldn't do any of this without you listening, so thank you and just know you are valued and appreciated. We are mindful that you are listening and we are grateful that you are listening. So thank you so much. You are mindful about us being mindful. Don't forget to keep checking up on foreverbreak.com slash podcast where there's an abundance of information and watch this space where yours truly will be returning for a second season in the near future. We know you're going to miss us, really. All right, voiceover guy. One more time. Have at it. Thanks, guys. We make a great team. Subscribe now to the Forever Break podcast on your favorite platform, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. If you enjoyed this episode, help us out and leave a five-star review. And remember, you can find all the juicy details discussed in this episode in the show notes at foreverbreak.com slash podcast.